Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Tim Harvey Samuel. Tim is currently a senior postdoctoral scientist at the Peerbright Institute in England. Before Tim arrived at the Peerbright, he was at Oxford University, where, in conjunction with OxyTech, developed a transgenic autocidal system to control the diamondback moth Plutella xylosa. This system was field tested at Cornell University in New York a couple of years ago. Tim has more recently worked on developing a gene drive system that would be functional in the diamondback moth, and we're going to hear about that today. Tim is also working on various mosquito systems that are of great significance to public health. Tim, thanks for participating in the webinar series. We're really looking forward to hearing about your work. Welcome, and let me turn the floor over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much for that, invita uh, for that introduction and also for the invitation to speak to you all today uh, about some of the work we've been doing at the Perbright Institute um, in the UK. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Tim Harvey Samuel. I'm a postdoc at the Probar Institute, and I've been uh, over the last few years. I've been working on a project uh, which aims to develop and move some of the technologies, which have been, as David put uh, very eloquently, have been uh, have been built um, to proof of proof of principle level in some dipterin species, and see if we can move them into some lesser uh, used. Uh, Pest. So, for example, the Lepidopterans. Specifically, we were looking at the Diamondback moth, Plutella xylostella. So that's what I'm going to be telling you about today. But before I get into that, there we go. Before I get into um, my talk today, I'd first like to say uh, a great thank you and a big acknowledgement to Shweja. Uh, Dr. Shui Jia Zhu um, uh, was a PhD student at the Fujian Agriculture and Forestry University. She came to visit Perbright uh, for uh, part of her PhD. That was meant to only be for a year, but due to COVID, uh, Shui Jia ended up staying with us for about three years, which was pretty distressing for Shui Jia, but actually pretty good for this project. Um, so we managed to do a huge amount of work over that time, uh, which resulted in a number of publications. And I'm very pleased to uh, be able to say that uh, after Shui Jiao's uh, PhD, she managed to get a postdoc at Jackson Champers lab at the University of Beijing, where she continues to work on gene drives now more in mosquitoes. So if you are interested in gene drives and you are working in China and want to get in touch, please do uh, get in touch with Shui Jiao because she's great um, and would be a great person to work with and Jackson as well. So what can you expect from my talk today? Um, well, I thought I would divide up this talk up into do two different uh, components, two different parts. The first is to give some background on gene drives and, and, and get everyone up to speed on the particular types of gene drives that we're working on uh, here, mostly at Perbright and in the Diamondback Moth. So I'm aware that a lot of people in this uh, that are listening today will be far will be very uh, comfortable with this topic and perhaps even know more than I do on this. But just to get everyone up to the same speed before we get into the technical details, I thought I'd just go over this briefly. So, for example, what are the characteristics which all gene drive systems share? How are people thinking about using these for pest control? Um, so that relates to what we refer to as the control phenotype. And then the going over the mechanics of uh, the type of gene drive system that we're building, uh, or we tried to build in, G in the Diamondback Moth, which is known as a CRISPR-Cas9 homing drive, and a specific uh, twist on the homing drive, which is known as a split drive. And I'll be going into uh, the reason why we chose that split drive design as well. So having gotten hopefully everyone up to speed on gene drives, and then going to be talking through uh, what we actually did in Diamondback Moth or DBM. Um, so first of all, why were we looking at uh, Plutella xylostella? Why is that a target organism that is worthy of research into novel, uh, novel genetic control tools? Uh, and then I'm going to be talking about all the steps you need to to take in order to be able to test a gene drive system in a novel pest like uh, a lepidopteran. So identifying the regulatory elements that we need to express the Cas9, identifying the sgRNA target genes, uh, and then the testing of these, uh, these um, uh, technologies. 
So we can test these technologies by looking at whether the, 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 the editing is working in the, the soma of those organisms in, in the non germline cells. But then what we're really interested in uh, when we're talking about gene drives is actually what's happening in the germline, because either these are the cells that are going to be passed on to the next generation. And we can look at two different bits of information in the germline. We can look at the homing ability. So I'll go, be going over what homing exactly means. Uh, but this is the actual mechanism by which this particular type of gene drive spreads. But we can also be looking at what's known as the cutting ability or the editing ability. So this is not necessarily independent of homing, but it's a different uh, piece of information. And depending on how we set up our experiments, we could potentially be getting a lot more uh, information to crunch at the end, depending uh, by being able to piece out both the cutting and the homing ability. And then finally, I'm going to be uh, talking about the conclusions from our work, summarizing what we learned, what we achieved, and what we could do to move this field forward. So first of all, what is a gene drive system? And I think everyone who works on gene drives uh, uh, would be very keen for me to point out that there are a huge number of different gene drive systems. And in fact, there are far more naturally occurring gene drive systems than there are gene drives that have been engineered in the lab. Although, of course, they are getting a lot of press at the moment um, through these engineered uh, versions. And no matter what type uh, of gene drive system you have, whether it's a natural or an engineered one, and the mechanisms by which it works, whether that's as an endosymbiont, a, hunt, uh, a killer rescue system, translocations, under dominance, jumping genes, or in a, a full synthetic biology context, they all share two characteristics in common, which uh, define them as gene drives. These are, firstly, that they enter and move through a population via mating. They're vertically transmitted uh, um, um, elements, genetic elements. So what does that, that, that sets them apart from other biological control techniques. For example, things like uh, the use of bacteria, uh, entomopathogenic fungi, uh, viruses. Uh, these all can be transmitted horizontally within a, within a population. These gene drive systems are either encoded within the genomes of the individuals, um, or they are within the cells of that individual. And that means the only way that that gene drive can be passed through the population is via mating. So this actually uh, brings about one of the main defining characteristics of these types of gene drives, these types of uh, gene drives as a pest control technique, which is that they work uh, at the generate on the generation time of the pest that you are try that you're targeting. So if you have the exact same type of gene drive system with the exact same mechanic uh, mechanism in a long lived mammal, a relatively long lived mammal, like a, a mouse or even a, uh, a cat, that will uh, take a lot longer to have an effect on the population than would a very short generation time uh, organism pest, for example, things like yeast, um, or even uh, well, insects, of course, which is why a lot of the early development of this type of technology has, of course, occurred in very short-lived, uh, sorry, short generation time insects like Drosophila. Secondly, and the thing which everybody really knows these systems for is that they have this capacity for autonomous spread. So what does that mean? It means that under certain, uh, if certain parameters are satisfied under certain situations, these, can, these systems can increase in population frequency over generations once introduced into a population. So those parameters that need to be satisfied, the, um, those caveats that need to be satisfied are usually things related to the introduction frequency. So how many, um, how many of your gene drive organisms you introduce into your, your target population and also the fitness costs that, that the, uh, the drive system imparts on the individuals that carry it. But what's really important about these types of systems and the reason why we can think about using them in a pest control context is because they can increase in population frequency even if they're deleterious to the individuals that inherit them. And that means that we're able to spread, uh, uh, we are able to spread potentially uh, deleterious phenotypes or traits through target pest populations. And that's obviously something we would 
uh, we would want to do in a pest control context to control those, those individuals. So there are two main ways that people have thought about using these types of uh, gene drives uh, for, uh, for pest control, and they can be divided by what we normally refer to them, uh, refer to as the control phenotype. So this is the effect the drive system has on the target population once you release that drive system into that, into that population. So there are two main types of control phenotype. Um, we have population suppression and we have population replacement or also known as population modification. So in population suppression, but, uh, what you're trying to do is, is very similar to how we normally try and control uh, pests or things we don't want to be around. We're basically just trying to get rid of them. We're trying to re reduce the target population density to the point where it's either no longer damaging to us or to what we're trying to protect, or it may even go extinct. So in this case, you're spreading a gene drive system that carries, that imparts a genetic load on that population as it spreads. So the classic examples of this are, are it is female recessive sterility, although in some cases male re uh, recessive sterility can also work, though potentially not as, um, not, not as efficiently. So here, what you're trying to do is you're trying to reduce the reproductive output of the individuals on average that inherit the that have inherited the drive system across the population. So as it spreads through the population, more and more individuals um, carry these these deleterious alleles. Their reproductive uh, output of the population reduces, and eventually the population may go extinct. Population replacement or modification, on the other hand, is has a very different goal. Here, the, the, the aim is not necessarily to change the density of the population, although that may, that may happen along the way, uh, but rather what we're trying to do is we're, we are trying to replace the population, modify it in such a way that it's no longer deleterious, it's no longer damaging to either us or whatever it is that we're trying to protect. So the, the classic example here is the spreading of an anti-malarial gene through a population or an anti-pathogen gene. We refer to these as refractory genes often. These are genes which, when inherited by a particular organism, will make that organism either less able to harbor or vector a particular disease that we're worried about. So here, as you spread, you release your gene drive uh, individuals into the target population. What's happening is they are increasing in frequency over time. And if we link uh, this um, anti-malarial gene, let's say, uh, to our gene drive system as what we refer to as a cargo gene, then that cargo element, that refractory system will be spread through the population as the gene drive system uh, as spreads to the point where if we can get it to a high enough frequency in the population, we can effectively immunize the, the vector population against carrying that disease, breaking the disease cycle potentially, uh, or even getting rid of the disease completely in that population. So the, the types of pest that you would target with these two different strategies are very different. Um, whereas agricultural pests and pests of conservation, uh, invasive species of conservation um, uh, importance, you're usually looking at trying to uh, suppress their populations. So for example, with diamondback moth, we were ultimately looking to build, uh, to, to develop tools that could be used to build a, uh, to build into a population suppression tool because you're really just trying to get rid of the larvae. So for example, or whatever it is that's eating your crop, you don't necessarily want to modify it. You just want them not to be there. On the other hand, the population replacement is um, uh, mainly aimed, is primarily aimed at vectors. So these are uh, disease vectors, although there are some other uh, ways that you could potentially use these. Disease vectors don't need to only be targeted by population replacement. So there are ongoing, uh, there's ongoing research by multiple groups which are trying to build both population suppression as well as population replacement um, uh, elements uh, for vector species. Just in general, uh, very generally, um, population replacement tend to be slight, uh, slightly more uh, complex in, in terms of their design because you also need to engineer the cargo gene, and that can be a whole different project. Uh, the population suppression um, tools in theory are much more simple to design. However, they are also um, uh, very difficult to design in such a way that they're robust because here you're trying to spread a genetic load through a population and that population is going to be trying to resist 
that uh, modification pretty strongly. So whereas these are relatively susceptible to uh, resistance developing in the population, the in your target population, the replacement systems aren't, but potentially are a lot more difficult to um, engineer due to their extra components. But those are all very uh, broad generalizations. So the type of uh, gene drive system that we were trying to build in Diamondback Moth is known as a CRISPR-Cas9 uh, CRISPR homing drive. So this is based again uh, on the, the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology. The very first versions of these homing drives were not uh, proposed using CRISPR-Cas9. They were proposed using um, previously, uh, well, other gene editing technologies, specifically the homing endonuclease genes. Um, however, when CRISPR-Cas9 came about, because it's so much easier to respecify, they very it very quickly overtook uh, pre-existing uh, technologies, but the, the basic design or the idea of these systems has been around for a relatively long time, first proposed by Austin Burt. Um, so what happens when you're building one of these gene drive systems? I, I am assuming here that people are fairly familiar with both Cas the, the, the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology. For those that aren't, very, very quickly, Cas9 is a protein, it's an endonuclease. Um, it, cuts DNA, causing a double-stranded break. Guide RNA is a single-stranded piece of RNA, which complexes with your Cas9 protein and directs the Cas9 to a sequence, a DNA sequence, which is complementary to its, its own RNA sequence. So when you have Cas9 Cas and the guide RNA together in a cell um, or in a tube with some DNA, uh, they, the guide RNA will uh, direct Cas9 to uh, its complement, and Cas9 will cut that DNA in a very, very specific place uh, specified by the guide RNA. So what we do when we're building a CRISPR-Cas9 homing drive is we actually integrate both of those components, the CRISPR, uh, the, the a gene which expresses Cas9 and a gene which expresses the guide RNA um, into the genome of the, of the pest that we are trying to target. And we integrate those in a very specific place. We have to integrate them uh, at the exact point to be most efficient, at the exact point uh, where that guide RNA specifies Cas9 to cut. So that's a bit of a mouthful. So another way to, to think about it is if you have a wild type locus, which I've referred to here as AB, and let's say there's an exact point between this uh, A and the A and B parts of this locus, which are specified, that's where the guide RNA will specify Cas9 to cut. What you will do if you want to build the CRISPR-Cas9 homing drive is you will integrate Cas a gene expressing Cas9 and a gene expressing the guide RNA at that exact point between A and B. But how does that actually cause a gene drive system? Well, you have to think about these, these gene drive, um, uh, this, this homing drive as a, as a heterozygote. So let's imagine we have a gene drive heterozygote. This has a single copy of um, this is a diploid organism. Um, so we have a single copy of uh, the Cas9 gene and the guide RNA gene. They are between A and B, and they are in, they've been inherited in an individual that has a single wild type uh, copy uh, at, that, at that locus. So this is the homologous chromosome. In the cells of that organism, you will have uh, Cas9 protein and the guide RNA being expressed. They'll complex together. They'll be directed to the wild type homolog, and they will cut it they'll create this double-stranded break. And cells in general do expend a huge amount of energy trying to make sure that these double-stranded, to, to repair these double-stranded breaks. And that's because it, it causes all sorts of problems that they're trying to go through the cell replication cycle if you have these double-stranded breaks. So there, there's a numerous different ways which the cell can repair those breaks. And what we're hoping it does is it employs what's known as the homology directed repair pathway or the HDR pathway. And what the HDR pathway does is the cell basically looks around um, the, the other DNA in the cell and it looks for things which look like the sequences on either side of the break. So in this case, it looks around the cell and it looks for other things which look like A and B because what it's doing is it's looking for the wild type homolog in a dipterin, which in general, would be a pretty good repair template with which to repair this, this double-stranded break. However, what we've done ahead of time is we've integrated the Cas9 guide RNA at that cut site. So what we're doing is basically tricking the cell 
into using our gene drive as a repair template to repair this double-stranded break, which the gene drive has itself caused. So you don't need to worry too much about this, but essentially this is known as the homing reaction. So the cell, um, their strand invasion, uh, the wild type homolog invades the, um, the intact uh, transgene, copies it across, thinks it's repaired the break, ligates all the breaks, and you what has started off as a gene drive heterozygote organism, now in the, in the same generation is a gene drive homozygote cell. And this doesn't necessarily have to happen in all cells, but what is really important is that it happens in the germline of that organism. So if this reaction happens, let's say we're talking about moths, if this ha reaction happens in the wing or the antenna or one of the legs of that moth, it's cool, but it's really not going to have any impact on your system at the population level. What you need to do is you need to ensure that this reaction is happening in the germline, so the cells in that organism, which will go on to make the sperm and the eggs of that organism, because of that organism because those are the cells that are going to influence what the frequency of the drive is in the next generation. So let's imagine this is happening in the germline. What would happen in a normal heterozygote is that that, um, that cell would pass on 50% uh, of the transgene to 50% of its gametes that it was making and 50% would be wild type. But because this is now a homozygote, it's now passing it on to 100% of the gametes it's making. So as long as this happens over 50%, we get an exponential increase in the frequency of the drive system over generations at the population level. So this is a very, this is, this is a, um, um, some modeling um, which uh, shows this uh, exponential increase behavior um, as you're getting uh, a proportion of the germline. It doesn't have to be 100%, but the, the more, the, the higher the percentage of the germline that you are converting each generation to be homozygous, the, the faster this gene drive system will spread to fixation. But what we were trying to do uh, in the Dimeback moth was, a, a, was, was not develop one of these, what we refer to as all-in-one or, uh, or global gene drive systems. We were trying to build what's known as a split drive. And a split drive is slightly different to that design. And it takes advantage of the fact that the, the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing system is a binary system. It com it's composed of two different parts, the Cas9 and the guide RNA. And these don't need to be integrated at the same site in order for the gene drive to work. In fact, you don't actually need either of these two components to be integrated at the site which will be copied across in order for that site to home. So potentially. So what we do, um, when we're building one of these split drives is we, uh, we still have our locus Y, um, which we refer to as our homing locus. Um, and that's the same as the locus, which was uh, had the Cas9 and the guide RNA previously. But now we have integrated the Cas9 the transgene at an independent locus. So this is a non-homing locus, which I've referred to as locus X. However, if these two transgenes are inherited in the same organism, Oh, sorry. You can still get the Cas9 being protein being expressed in the in that cell. You can still have it being co uh, complexing with the guide RNA. You can still have it cutting the wild type homolog, and you can still have the guide RNA being uh, transgene being copied across potentially in that homing reaction. So you might be asking yourself, why would you want to do that? That seems like quite complicated um, and also potentially not as efficient. And the major advantage of this type of split drive design is uh, what we refer to as confinability or control of the system um, once it's released. So in the previous uh, example of the all-in-one of the global drive that I explained on the previous slide, because all the components that the, that the gene drive needs to replicate itself are replicated each generation, it, uh, in, e in each homing reaction, it means that you get this very characteristic exponential increase of the drive system. This is assuming you don't have any sort of resistance developing. So what that's extremely efficient from a pest management point of view, but it also means, at least theoretically, that this system, once released, will spread to any interbreeding uh, population of that 
species. And we may, that in some species that might be great, we may want to remove that species, that, that pest from the whole of the earth or potentially the whole of the earth. But for the majority of pest species, uh, and especially when we're looking at the, uh, these types of systems from a regulatory point of view, that's actually a pretty big disadvantage and could cause you quite a lot of problems. If you can't say with some certainty that when you release this system, it's gonna stay uh, in the area you put it and for a specified amount of time. Just as a really simple example, um, some, pet, some individuals are pests, some species are pests in some part of the world, they might be an invader, an invasive species. However, that doesn't necessarily mean we wanna get rid of them in their native range. They might even be endangered in their native range. So the ability to uh, confine one of these drive systems geographically and also, uh, and also um, temporally is, is a, a major benefit. And a lot of people have spent a lot of time trying to do that through various different designs. One of them is this split drive design. And the thing that makes this split drive design more confinable is the fact that the two, the, not all the components that the drive needs to replicate itself are copied every generation. So whereas the guide RNA is being is being um, is going from one copies to two copies each generation, you'll notice that the Cas9 doesn't. It's not. It doesn't increase in uh, in in frequency. So what would happen? We would expect if we release this system into the wild would be that the Cas9 would at best remain neutral in the population, although more likely it would start to slowly drop out of the population over time. And that's because these transgenes are in general, deleterious to the individuals that, that carry them. You've disrupted the genome by integrating it in there. You're expressing a whole load of exogenous proteins in that cell. In general, they are, they're, they're not great for the individuals that carry them. However, that contrasts to the behavior of the gRNA or the sgRNA uh, transgene. And as you can see at the very beginning, when Cas9 is at still at a relatively high frequency, you, the, the guide RNA is actually showing this potentially in, uh, exponential increase at the very beginning, but then it starts to tail off. And that's because the, um, the uh, homing frequency uh, of the guide RNA cassette will be a function of the remaining frequency of the Cas9 in the population and the frequency at which those two components are co-inherited in individuals. So what that means is that Cas9 is effectively a limiting factor. Um, that doesn't, so you can still get the guide RNA up to relatively high frequencies, but because these two systems, these two genes are not linked together, and we spend a lot of time in our designs trying to ensure that that will not happen, that they will segregate and you'll get this, um, this, this kind of uh, differential behavior between the, 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 the two transgenes. That's not to say that you can't uh, increase the efficiency of this system because you could set supplement by releasing more Cas9 individuals, which would bump up your guide RNA, uh, but ultimately it will always remain um, uh, confinable or uh, spatially restricted. Over time, as Cas9 goes to extinction, we would actually expect the guide RNA to start to drop out as well, unless it reached fixation. Okay, well, having explained to you a bit about homing drives and split drives and CRISPR-Cas9, I'm now going to be walking you through uh, the work we actually did in Plutella's Isla Stella, um, trying to build one of these systems. And so for those of you that aren't familiar with Plutella um, or the diamondback moth, it's a lepidoptrin. It's relatively small, probably um, less than a centimeter in length as an adult. Um, it is uh, a huge agricultural pest, but it's also uh, becoming a real model organism for uh, lepidopteran molecular work. So the, of course the model system is silkworm, um, but a lot of the tools which were, prior, were previously developed in silkworm are now being developed as well in dimeback moth. Um, dimeback moth has the advantage of a much shorter generation time. It doesn't diapause. It's very easy to rear in the lab, very fecund. Um, and so that is why we decided to work on the Dimeback moth. Um, it also, of course, has this added advantage, which is that it is a huge agricultural pest. So it has a real world significance, this model organism, if we can build a genetic control tool in there. Silkworm, of course, is also uh, very economically important, but it is extremely domesticated. It doesn't actually exist in the wild. 
um, the domestic silkworm. So we thought if we can try and build one of these uh, gene drive systems in uh, uh, a lepidopteran with real world significance, then that would be really something. So the diamondback moth uh, is an extremely important pest of cruciferous crops or brassicas. So these are basically all the things that kids hate to eat. So cauliflowers, um, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, um, or everything with lots of glucosinolates, that bitter taste. Um, but these are actually grown uh, a lot around the world. They're huge cash crops, especially uh, uh, by small scale farmers in Southeast Asia. And those small scale farmers are relatively vulnerable to things like market forces, to changes in um, in yield from year to year because they are really they are operating often you know uh, on, on backyard farms um, and so the, this pest this is this being the major pest really uh, is a big problem for individual growers trying to build uh, trying to grow these crops around the world. And part of the reason why it's such a huge problem is that it has this, it's extremely invasive. It has this global distribution. It's basically spread to wherever um, um, uh, brassicas are grown around the world today. So uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, live the whole year, for example, in Northern uh, America, in North America or in South America, but it uh, invades each summer and goes up to those areas and then goes extinct over the winter, but it continually invades. But basically it's it's everywhere around the world that brassicas are grown. Um, and uh, it's also in some areas where there are wild progenitors of brassicas, which can act as over uh, uh, some overwintering uh, crops, for example, between, between the cropping seasons. It's also extremely resistant to insecticides. So this is the main way these uh, people try and control uh, agricultural pests in general, but the lep uh, lepidopterans in particular. Um, it is the was the first species to develop resistance to DDT and um, to, sorry to BT in the field, uh, and strains of diamondback moth have been uh, found which are resistant to every class of synthetic chemical insecticide that we have. So in summary, this pest, it attacks uh, high value crops that are grown by vulnerable farmers. It's spreading around the world and the tools that we have to, uh, to combat it are becoming less effective. So we really need to develop alternative, more sustainable tools for managing these populations in the wild. And that's why we thought uh, building a gene drive in it would be pretty, pretty cool. So what do we need to do what are the different components that we need to build in order to test whether a gene drive system is working in a novel organism? Well, we need at least two types of transgenic lines. And the first are transgenic lines um, of that organism which express Cas9, the Cas9 protein. Again, very important that that uh, is expressing in the germ line of that organism. So the cells that will go on to be the, the eggs and, and the, the sperm. And we also need transgenic lines which express the sgRNA or the guide RNA. And those again need to be integrated. Uh, those, they have to have transgenes which are integrated at the precise point which is targeted by that sgRNA. We then need to cross the two together and uh, do various experiments. So when we were setting out to, um, to, to see if we could build those two types of transgenic lines in diamondback moth, we had to start from scratch because there had been, as, unlike in uh, dipterans and even in some uh, in silkworm, we really did not have a good uh, understanding of the genes that were expressed in the germline of the diamondback moth, and especially the regulatory elements of those genes, which we could use to direct expression of Cas9 to the germline. So the first thing that Shui Zhao and I did was we searched the literature and we tried to come up with, uh, tried to identify genes which had been used by people building or trying to express uh, genes in the germ lines of insects um, and basically see what they looked like in dimeback moth. So we came up with a couple of ones that were looked, uh, that we identified from uh, work that was ongoing in our lab at the time. Um, in Aedes aegypti, so BGCN, the shutdown homologs, there's two shutdown homologs in, in lepidopterans, SDS3, uh, NANOS, which is uh, 
been extremely well used, especially in uh, Drosophila gene drive systems. And unhelpfully in Lepidopterans, there are four nanos homologs. So we had to test them all to see which, if any of them had retained some germline expression. Um, and then MyW68, which is the uh, insect, uh, the insect homolog of SPO11. So SPO11, people might be familiar, more familiar with SPO11. This is a gene which is expressed during meiosis, which is prior to meiosis, is involved with creating the breaks that go on to form the, the crossovers during meiosis. And that hints, the, the expression pattern of my, my W68 hints at the type of timing that we were really trying to go for when we were choosing these genes. We didn't want it to just, these genes to just express at any time in the germline. We wanted them to express um, prior to meiosis uh, and pretty close to meiosis. So this is the point when the cells are basically, we, we believe they are set up uh, to, um, to, to uh, for crossing over. So that the two homologs are in close uh, proximity to each other, which we believe, again, uh, anecdotally, would, would be conducive to that homing reaction occurring. If you're trying to do it at another time, especially after the two homologs have separated, it's obviously much harder to envision how homing would occur or maybe you would say it might even be impossible afterwards. We also looked, um, or along with our collaborators at uh, Fujian, at the Vasa gene. Um, however, as we had looked at, uh, sorry, um, while we used RT-PCR of different, uh, of different tissues from Diamondback Moth um, to, to look for potential genes that were of interest, uh, they used uh, QPCR. So perhaps a, a little bit more sensitive there, but the main the the way the the experiment was basically the same. We just uh, dissected loads of individuals, uh, dissected out their gonads, and and ran those um, those PCRs to see which were expressing at the time points that we were interested in. So this was in the the adult ovaries and testes, um, and again in the ovaries and the testes. Uh, we eventually decided to go with three of these, uh, MyW68, Nanos P, and, the, and Vasa. And the reason for this was because we, we, we didn't necessarily go for those which gave us the highest expression in the ovaries and the testes and the gonads. We were really concerned about trying to choose genes which were restricted to the highest degree to those tissues, to the germline, because with these homing drives, if you get deposition into the embryos, uh, for example, by the mother or the father, that can cause all sorts of problems. So in this first attempt, what we were really trying to do is get, is identify genes that were restricted to the germline. And that the ones which looked best to us were MyW68, Nanos P, and Vasa. We also needed to identify target genes into which, in, uh, in which to integrate our uh, sgRNA expressing cassettes. Um, and traditionally what people have done when they're uh, identifying, when they're building these systems to try and test them, for example, in diptrans, is they've chosen genes which give you a visible phenotype uh, when they are, uh, when they're in their homozygous knockout state. So when they have two loss of function mutations in that gene, they change their appearance in some way. And that can be highly advantageous when you're uh, trying to figure out what happened uh, in the germ lines of these organisms. And we'll go into that a little bit further later on. So we looked at two genes, uh, two eye color pigmentation genes in Plutella, um, kynurinine hydroxylase, also known as KMO. I'll refer to it as KMO for the remainder of this talk, and cardinal. And we found out when we knocked these out using CRISPR-Cas9, it causes a change in the eye pigmentation from wild type to KMO in this case. And it goes from black to kind of yellow or whitish. Similarly, at, uh, at a similar time, our collaborators at, at Fujian were looking at a, a different gene known as yellow. This is a body color gene, pigmentation gene. And when you knock that out, you get a change from this uh, wild type larva of Plutella, which is kind of a little bit tinted green and has a very dark black head capsule to more of a yellow larva as the name would suggest. Um, and also a, a much clearer uh, golden colored head capsule. So what was really important about these different uh, genes is not only were they uh, visible to us we're in their homozygous knockout state, but we were able to maintain lines uh, or knockout 
homozygous knockout lines uh, of these two, of, of KMO and cardinal, and also of the yellow mutation. And that's really important because you want these individuals to survive in their homozygous knockout state so you can screen them um, going forward. So we took all of that information that we had gathered from, uh, from the RT-PCRs and the qPCRs and also the knockouts, and we used it to build our various different gene drive constructs. Again, there are two different types of constructs. We have the constructs for expressing Cas9, and we have the constructs for expressing the sgRNA, and these are very different types of constructs. So I'll go over the Cas9 first. The first thing to note is that they all had a ZS green marker. Um, so that's a, a marker uh, gene which uh, makes the individuals that inherit it glow bright green under the fluorescent microscope. So that's how we track these, these um, integrations of these different lines. Uh, they all were piggyback insertions. So, uh, sorry, piggyback constructs. So this allowed us to make multiple random insertions or semi-random insertions of each of these constructs with which we could then test independently. The things that differed between these diff three different constructs was of course, how we, the, the regulatory elements we were using to express or hopefully express Cas9. So, um, you won't remember these numbers, but I'll continually refer to them and remind you, so don't worry about it. But we have 1536, which was using the regulatory elements, the promoter, 5' prime UTR and 3' prime UTR from VASA to control Cas9. Uh, 1906, which did the same thing, but with MyW68 or SPO11. And 2093, which did the same thing, but now with NanoSP. We also put um, an SV40 terminator sequence behind the 3' prime UTR, because it's a little bit iffy uh, as to whether, where a three prime UTR really ends. Um, so to make sure we had a strong termination, we, we, inter we, we use that as a kind of backup uh, terminator. So the sgRNA expression cassettes, as I said, were very different. Um, these were uh, integrated at precise points within the two target genes. So Plutella xylostella yellow and Plutella, Plutella xylostella KMO. We decided not to go to for cardinal in the end, we just we just went with KMO. And the design of these constructs is, uh, was as follows. They all had DS red markers. So again, same as the ZS green markers, but now they glow red. And red and green can be independently uh, identified under a fluorescence microscope. And that allowed us to identify individuals which had both uh, the red and the green. Uh, so had inherited both, uh, both different transgenes when we crossed them. They, all these constructs also had three different small genes um, for expressing the guide RNA. These were what we call U6 promoters. These are small promoters, endogenous promoters that are uh, in the normal Plutella, they express func small functional RNAs. So they're not capped. Those RNAs are not capped and tailed. And that's very important for sgRNA function. So each of these U6, guide, uh, U6 promoters expressed the same guide RNA. So these are not three different guide RNAs, they're the same guide RNA. And the reason why we did that is because this was the very first time we had built any sort of uh, U6 promoter construct in Dimeback Moth. Uh, we didn't know which of these was gonna work well. Um, we didn't have a Dimeback Moth cell line in which to, tell, uh, to test them. And we certainly didn't know which one was gonna work best in the germ line. So we decided to just uh, throw all three in and hope that one of them would work, uh, would, yeah, would work. So the 1619 was in yellow and 1963 or 1962 was in, in KMO. Uh, these are uh, um, HDR constructs, as you can see, instead of the piggyback flanks, they have these homology arms, the left homology arm and the right homology arm. So these were actually integrated into these genes at these precise points, causing knockout mutations, um, but also uh, transgenes, uh, integrating transgenes, which, which had these components. Um, and how you do that, how you make transgenic lines of each of these is you inject the, uh, the constructs into the embryos, the early embryos of the Dimeback moth, and then you cross them out and you screen to see which is uh, inherited, uh, has a genomic germline integration of these two trans, of these different transgenes. I'm not going to be talking too much about 1962. You don't need to really worry about it. This was just a backup construct which had three remaining uh, U6 promoters. Um, uh, sorry, uh, 
1963 had the had three different music promoters compared to uh, 1619. And 1962 had the, the same three U6 promoters as 1619. So these was just the check uh, again, because we didn't know which of these U6 promoters was gonna work best. We tried a uh, kind of belt and braces conservative approach by putting them all in. We didn't think that there was gonna be very much um, uh, problem with putting those multiple U6 promoters in there, um, but it would potentially allow us to get a gene dry result in, in the first, uh, it, at the first attempt. So how did we test to see whether gene drive was, was occurring or whether anything was occurring at all in these, in these lines? Um, well, I'm gonna go over the, the kind of experimental crosses that we, uh, that we conducted in order to figure that out. So prior to this, of course, what I haven't shown on this slide is that we actually made integrations of these different uh, um, transgenes. So, Whereas yellow sgRNA here refers to a, that uh, DS red integration into the yellow gene, which expresses the, that yellow guide RNA. Um, I should point out also just to be uh, uh, to um, reiterate that those sgRNAs um, were the exact sgRNA which targeted the point where this was integrated. So again, as we talked about A and B previously being the flanking regions. These sgRNAs targeted Cas9 to that exact point between A and B, and the same for KMO. So um, we, in, we made multiple integrations of each Cas9 uh, construct, and uh, usually just a single integration of the yellow sgRNA, because it was perfectly repaired, perfectly integrated, then the, all of those integrations should be pretty much exactly the same. So we started off by crossing these two lines together. And you can do that two ways. You can do it uh, from males from one line and females from the other, and then you could do it the other way. So uh, females from this line and males um, from this line. So you end up with uh, two different F0 crosses for each uh, combination of guide RNA cassette and Cas9 insertion. From that cross, um, sorry, I should say that these Cas9 individuals, uh, this Cas9 line, is wild type for yellow. Um, so it doesn't have any yellow knockouts. The yellow knock-in lines uh, have a single transgene in yellow, but otherwise are wild type and are wild type of Cas9 blockers as well. So when you cross these two together, you get your F1 generation and you screen for individuals which have inherited both the red transgene and the green transgene. And again, that's really important. Uh, that's, that's why we chose red and green because you can, um, you can screen them under a microscope and you can tell the difference um, between them even when they're in the same organism. So these individuals are that inherited both are known as <clears throat> trans heterozygotes. They have, uh, they have one copy of each of those trans genes. And those trans heterozygotes, of course, came in two flavors as well. They came as males and females. And to set up uh, the next cross, we Cross those individuals to um, a knockout line of the gene into which the sgRNA cassette had been integrated. <clears throat> so in this case, because we're talking about a yellow sgRNA cassette, um, we're integrating, we're using a yellow knockout line. And again, that's really important as to why you need to have, <coughs> excuse me, as to why you need to be able to maintain these as homozygous knockout lines. So we cross these individuals with the knockout lines, again, in two different uh, combinations, male, female, female, male, giving us a total of four F1 crosses because each of those can come from two different um, F0 crosses. And, we, and what we're really looking at uh, in this cross uh, is we're trying to figure out what happens to this wild type yellow allele here. We're trying in a, uh, in a gene drive if gene drive occurs, what will happen is this yellow sgRNA cassette will actually be uh, copied across and replace that yellow uh, wild type allele. So we can look at what happens to that yellow uh, wild type allele in multiple places within uh, these F1 individuals. We can look at what happens to their, their soma, so anything in the body except the germline. And we do that usually by looking at what we refer to as mosaics. So we're trying to look for disruption of the yellow gene in the soma of those individuals. 
But remember, what we're really in interested in is what's happening in the germline of those individuals, those F1 individuals. We're trying to see whether in the germline of those F1 individuals, that yellow wild type uh, allele is either being converted or modified in some way. So how do we figure out what's happening in the germline of those F1 individuals? We actually need to look into the next generation because again, those germline cells are the ones that are transferred to the next generation. So in a, uh, in a normal Mendelian system, um, if we think about these two genes just expressing green uh, fluorescent protein and red fluorescent protein, if there was no homing occurring, we would expect uh, a very natural Mendelian uh, inheritance of the two transgenes. 25% of the progeny in the F2 generation would carry both <clears throat> red and green. 25% each would be red and green, and 25% would be wild type. However, if homing has occurred, we'll see a, a bias, a change in these ratios because these what these yellow um, these yellow uh, these copies of the yellow gene which they've inherited from their F1 um, parent might have been modified. And if gene drive has occurred, we'll actually have seen them be replaced by the yellow sgRNA cassette. So what we're looking for to see whether a gene drive has occurred or not in these individuals is a change in the, uh, in a, is a statistically significant increase in the yellow sgRNA cassette, i.e. individuals uh, glowing red in the F2 generation above 50%. So if, that, if, if, if we see a statistically significant increase in the, the, the percentage of red individuals uh, above 50%, we assume that, that, has a, that those have got there because of the homing that occurred in the F1 generation. And there are two other phenotypes which we can potentially get in this cross. And these are abnormal phenotypes. These are not phenotypes which you would normally be able to see in a wild type, in a Mendelian cross. And these are um, individuals which don't carry the yellow sgRNA cassette. So they don't glow red, but they're still yellow knockouts. They are still yellow bodied, as you can see here. They carry two um, knockout copies. And the reason that can happen is because we crossed the F1 individuals to a yellow knockout strain. The reason why we'd want to do that is because this allowed the, the presence or the existence of these individuals allows us to tell whether cutting has occurred in the germline, even if homing hasn't occurred. And that is a really interesting and very vital piece of information um, for assessing what's happening in the germline of your individual. So the first thing we looked at was somatic editing of the F1. Again, this is what's happening just in the soma, the non-germline tissues of those initial F1 transheterozygotes. And in really encouragingly, what we saw both for the yellow insertion and also the KMO insertion was that <clears throat> we were getting quite consistent and in cases, in some cases, very robust disruption of uh, the pigmentation of these, that these different genes lay down when we combined both the, the, the Cas9 lines and their uh, respective sgRNA expressing lines. So in this case, in the case of yellow, there's this pigmented stripe on the back of the pupae, of the pupa. And you can see, whereas in wild type, it's very, it's, um, it's unbroken. Um, when you are getting Cas9 and the guide RNA is being expressed, we saw these blotchy patches of, uh, of unpigmented uh, tissue occurring. And it, was ex it varied between different crosses. So in the 2093, i.e. The, the Nanos P lines, it was really very, very strong. And for the 1906, the MIW68 lines, it was still there. However, it was much less apparent and in fewer individuals. So we were seeing a a difference already in the in the cutting rate in the in the gene editing rate between the different um, Cas9 insertions that we had created, and the same goes for KMO. Um, here we were looking at the eye because this is an eye pigmentation gene, whereas in wild type you get this kind of reddish eye. When you combined it with uh, in the same way uh, to the uh, the KMO transgenes, you saw a disruption of the eye pigmentation. So we got this stripy eye phenotype that again was. Uh, most evident in the, the 2093, the nanos P lines. This is just a slide to show you that it occurred in, um, it didn't occur in any of the non 
double, um, or except the KMO sgRNA line, but we don't need to talk about that. That's um, likely due to deposition. But in the double heterozygote lines, the Cas9 and the KMO sgRNA, or the Cas9 and the yellow sgRNA line, we saw quite a lot, up to 100% somatic editing in the F1s. Um, but that varied again. So in some of the uh, of the MyW68 lines, we saw no editing at all. And even within the different, uh, a single uh, line where there were multiple assertions, we, we saw a variance in the level of somatic editing. So this shows us, this was really exciting because this showed us that actually we were able to, for the first time, express this gene editing system, this CRISPR-Cas9 system from bacteria in diamondback moth and cause real time editing in the cells of that organism. Well, of course, what we were really, really interested in is what was happening in the germ lines of those F1 individuals. Um, and again, what we were looking for to see whether homing had occurred or not was a statistically significant increase uh, above 50% of the individuals in the F2 generation, so the progeny of those F1 trans transheterozygotes, which carried the G2, uh, sorry, which carried the sgRNA cassette. So in a very simplified way, an increase in the frequency of those which glowed red in, in the F2 generation, which is the color which marks out the sgRNA cassette. And uh, again, we tested that uh, for multiple Cas9 insertions for each of the different uh, promoters. So 1906, 1536 is Vasa, and 2093 is Nanos P. And we'd also tested that, uh, and we tested that for both KMO and also the KMO insertion, and also for the yellow insertion. We tested that in multiple, uh, four different ways for each um, of the uh, F0 sexes and the F1 sexes. Um, and all in all, we can say, unfortunately, we saw no evidence of homing in the F1 germline. So what you would expect to see, of course, would be as these, these uh, um, um, these means, these averages being quite high above and not overlap, their error bars not overlapping. Um, so, you know, that was uh, a bit of a disappointment because as I'm sure is evident from this slide, this was an incredible amount of work, um, tens of thousands of larvae screened in under the fluorescence microscope. But nonetheless, we were uh, not totally discouraged because we still had the ability to look at what was happening in the germline, even if we didn't see homing. And again, that was because we had taken the opportunity to cross out to these knockout lines in the F1 generation. So we, in the F2, we can look for these two weird phenotypes, these two abnormal phenotypes that shouldn't exist in a Mendelian system. And the presence of those two phenotypes in the, the, the yellow knockout individuals that don't glow red in the F2 generation can be taken as uh, having occurred because the F1 germline was cut, but not repaired um, by homing. So in this case, the, the yellow allele in the F1 germline was cut, but the cell used an alternative um, uh, repair mechanism that didn't copy the, uh, that didn't copy the sgRNA cassette across, but still disrupted that yellow gene. So this doesn't tell us 100% of the cutting events because there are a number that there's a number of ways in which it could cut and we would not be able to see it in this way, but this gives us a kind of a, 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 an estimate. And in, uh, especially for the 1536 for the VARS and the 2093 lines, we did see um, a robust and uh, not super high, but a repeatable level of cutting when we combine those with both the guide RNA, the guide RNA cassettes for yellow and also for KMO. 2093, as expected from our somatic cutting data, didn't as our somatic editing data didn't really show us very much. What was really encouraging and I thought was really interesting was that actually in broad terms, the trend which we saw uh, with um, 1536 and 2093 being stronger in terms of ger germline editing compared to 20, uh, the, 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 um, the 1906 lines, um, or sorry, the 2093D line in this case, um, was replicated in our Cas9 Western blocks. 
So whereas these two uh, transgenes uh, showed us a lot of uh, germline cutting and this one didn't, we also saw a lot of uh, Cas9 protein in the testes and the ovaries of those two lines. And we saw almost none at all in the 2093D isoline. Similarly, um, one thing to note here is these blue individuals are male F1 germlines and, uh, sorry, F, F1 individuals and the red are female F1 individuals. So in general, we saw a much higher rate of cutting in males compared to females. And this was again, uh, played, this played out in terms of the Western blots in the testes and the ovaries. There was a lot more protein in the testes than there was in the ovaries. And Although we weren't able, this is just a very general trend, we weren't able to analyze this statistically, this was very encouraging to me because this, uh, to my mind, is a good signal that what we're seeing here, this, this, this editing, the, these, these phenotypes, is actually the result of what's happening in the gonads, in the germline of, the, of those F1 individuals, as opposed to just being expressed early on in the somatic tissues, et cetera. So, Moving forward, um, what could we learn from this, these, these experiments? Well, we still believe that diamondback moth is a, an, an interesting pest to work on in terms of these molecular tools. And uh, with the growing problem that diamondback moth poses uh, and other lepidopterans as well, gene-derived based pest solution would be really very handy uh, for these, these pests. So we think it's worth continuing this research further. Um, we were able to, for the first time, develop, show that we could develop the tools that are necessary for testing whether a homing drive works in a lepidopteran. So there are a number of firsts from this, um, from this, from these experiments. We were, for the first time, able to integrate a um, large knock-in by a CRISPR-Cas9 HDR into any lepidopteran. So it's silkworm, it's not been achieved yet in silkworm. We were able to identify um, and, uh, and create germline active Cas9 expressing insertions, although they weren't super uh, extremely strong. We were able to show that they were expressing in the germline. And we were able to identify a number of homozygous viable target knockout genes uh, um, and integrate the cassettes into those genes. So combining these tools, we were able to demonstrate extremely high levels of somatic cutting, which was exciting and also repeatable, but very much lower levels of germline cutting. So moving forward, um, what we would really like to do is to be able to uh, demonstrate whether homing is actually occurring or not. And at this point, it's very difficult to say whether homing can occur in a lepidopteran or not. Uh, because our levels of germline cutting were relatively low, we'd really wanna try and increase that before we could uh, definitively say that homing um, was or was not occurring in, in this pest. So how would we do that? I think what we really need to do is go back um, and identify uh, why our, trans, our Cas9 transgenes were not expressing uh, very highly in the, uh, in the germline. That could be because we had missed out some important regulatory elements from the, um, from the endogenous genes, or it could be that those genes just don't express very highly in the germline and we need to move on to uh, try other genes. Um, so the, the very fast generation time and the molecular tools of Dimebag Moth will allow us to look at those questions um, in great detail. So as I think hopefully will be uh, apparent throughout this uh, presentation, this was a huge amount of work and that wasn't all conducted by Shui Zhao and myself. So uh, an incredible thanks goes to all the people who helped us do this project. Um, Michelle, Christine, Erica, Josh, Ruth and uh, Siddiqui, um, who were all prior members of um, the Alfie Lab down at York. Of course, thank you also to Luke, who was our, pre our previous boss down here at Perbright and is now up at York. Um, also still building gene drives in mosquitoes. Um, thank you to Phil at uh, UEA who crunched all the stats for us um, uh, on this project. And of course, to the, the funders for this project for giving us the money to see if it could happen or not. So with that, I'll say thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to take them. Thanks a lot, Tim. Really, uh, really interesting. And uh, 
a tremendous amount of work to, to that uh, that you did to to get as far as you did. Um, I, in some ways, uh, and, and before I before I uh, have to say anything else, let me encourage people to uh, uh, ask questions. Now you'll be able to ask questions two ways. Now uh, you could chat them in, and, and I know some people have chatted their questions in, and we'll get to those uh, right away. You can also uh, raise your hand if you'd like, and I know a few people have done that, and we will be able to uh, recognize you and unmute you. You can ask your question uh, orally, uh, so we encourage you to do that as well. So uh, so before I, I get to some of the questions, I'll just make a comment. I mean, it sounds um, very much like some of the experiences that some of the mouse people have had with some of their uh, work in that uh, getting a germline homing was uh, difficult um, uh, to do. So it, so do you think that, so my question really is at this point, one of the things that, that some of the mouse folks have done is they've actually gone in a different direction in terms of the type of drive system that they're, they're now employing. So, um, so it was your thoughts at this point really to sort of try to work out the homing problem, you know, that is to, to increase uh, HDR in some way or find ways to improve the rates or perhaps to think about alternative drive system? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's multiple answers to that question. I think in Diamondback Moth and Leopard Doctrines in general, we're relatively limited in terms of the designs that we can choose. And that's partly because, again, we're an agricultural pest. Um, so, that, you know, we're, we're mainly looking at homing drives. Um, of course, uh, uh, so some of the other technologies, for example, under dominant systems or uh, toxin antidote systems are less relevant to us uh, because we're not generally not just trying to spread something, we're trying to reduce the population, which only really homing drives have been shown to be able to do. Of course, there are the shredders, um, that I would say to that, so the X shredders, etc. The issue with lepidoptions and shredders is that there's not a good location to put those shredders because unlike um, things like mice um, all the mosquitoes that i know of drosophila um, the female is the heterogametic sex in in lepidoptrans so they have a w chromosome that makes them um, or not all of them but certainly plutella makes them female so unlike uh, an x shredder where you could locate it on the x and it can become, it can become a sorry you can like locate it on the y and it can become a driving system um, you're very much more limited in a uh, in in a in a in a lepidoptrin context. You can create a system whereby females have no. Um, uh, you can only shred the, the W chromosome in females, um, but then of course you have to skip a generation before you can then enact that system again. Um, so, what I would say is that we are far from the time when it's uh, we've we've. Although this looked like a lot of work, we're far from being able to say that this won't work. I still have a lot of hope. Um, and I would probably encourage people to put their effort into uh, trying to find ways of expressing uh, Cas9 in the germline at a much higher rate. Yeah. Yeah, these, uh, this, this problem of having uh, good, good regulatory elements just is is a universal challenge for anybody making uh, genetically modified organisms. I'm going to get to some of the questions now that have been uh, chatted in first. Uh, Emily Wamba asks, uh, if gene drives naturally are, uh, are nat naturally occur in living organisms, then is this process random? Uh, if yes, is it is it always beneficial? If not, then does the cell have a way to eliminate these bad cases? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think the, the question was, are natural gene drives um, uh, beneficial um, to the organism? And if not, do the, does the organism get rid of them? I would say not, no, not necessarily. They're, they're selfish genetic elements. So it doesn't really matter to these pieces of DNA what happens to the organism as long as they increase in frequency. Um, so, as I said, that that is actually the power of these elements from an applied context, because we can spread uh, deleterious elements through a population. Um, there, of course, will be uh, 
resistance that develops to uh, elements, especially if those elements cause a, uh, to, to gene drives, especially if those elements cause a sex ratio bias. Um, so the kind of the classic uh, ideology or what people always say is that, oh, uh, natural gene drives are really difficult to find because they're either fixated in the population or, they, they, or they've gone, that population's gone extinct. So you really have to find, it's very rare to find a gene drive system, a naturally occurring gene drive system, which is in the process of driving. So an example would be the T-haplotype in mice, um, which is being co-opted now. It's one of the few examples of a, a, a natural gene drive system, which is being co-opted for control. Um, uh, but that's a relatively rare phenomenon. Okay, so uh, you hear, uh, Ahmad uh, has a question. He says, how much is revert? Yeah, I think the question is about, um, says, how much is reversion to this method? I think the question is, how much, um, yeah, how much resistance or reversion do you get of these uh, gene drives? I think that was his, uh, the nature of his question. He just chatted in. Uh, Meaner, if you uh, uh, want to clarify, let me know. Just uh, I did the best I could. Yeah, so I, I guess in a very simplified, in a very simplistic way, um, the amount of resistance or the the um, the evolution of resistance will be uh, dependent on the fitness costs. Will be related to the fitness costs that are imposed by the drive. So a drive which causes very low fitness costs will have relatively little selection against it. A drive which imposes very great fitness costs, whether that's because it disrupts an allele or because it's just um, deleterious in some way will be very strongly selected against. Um, theoretically, you can design these systems such that as they are neutral, i.e. they have no fitness costs. But in, in reality, um, it's difficult to envisage a system will, that will be 100% neutral in the wild. Um, so yeah, it, the, the, the answer is, yeah, uh, it differs between different designs. Yeah. I'm going, to, I'm going to skip down. There's a question here from Raul Medina, which I think is a, a particularly interesting question that um, that, I, that I'd like to have you respond to. And uh, thanks, Raul, for attending and asking the question. And the question is, do you think the level of confinement provided by split drives is reliable enough to allow for the release of gene drive organisms at the center of origin of some pests, say like screwworms in uh, South America? So I don't know. It, I mean, that it's the issue. It seems like two questions there. One, it, one has to do with the the level of confinability, and the other then has to be, you know, uh, the other the other part of the question is, you know, where where you might be able to release these given given the confinability. Yeah. I think it's it's a difficult question to answer because the level of confinement that we will be required for. Um, different pests will be entirely dependent on how easily they move around. So um, their, uh, how they, their dispersal, whether they can lay down long seed banks, et cetera. Um, so their, their basic stickiness in the population. So for a, 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 a pest which can disperse thousands of miles, um, then uh, you're obviously going to require a system which... Uh, constrains it to a greater extent um, than, um, than a system, than a pest which has a very low dispersal um, ability. I guess the other way of thinking about this um, is also, you know, that you, the, the question requires, to answer that question, you really need to know um, to what extent you need confinement. So, you know, do I think that these systems can confine uh, a pest to a certain area? Yes, the modeling shows that they can. Um, whether, I mean, these systems are likely to only be worse in the wild than they are in the on people's computers and in the lab. So I would not anticipate that they'll be better and spread further. Um, I think the real question is how, uh, how much do we need to confine these systems? And that will be dependent on a whole load of social and regulatory issues. For some species, 
we'll need to confine them to uh, just a very particular area. And some, for some, you'll be, it won't really matter that much, you know. Um, so in the case of diamondback moth, um, they they can disperse um, relatively far, of course. Um, and you know, I haven't done the exact modeling on the diamondback moth populations, but um, you would be able to localize that because of the, at the rate at which they segregate that to a relatively small area. Um, you know, I don't know the exact um, geographic area. So is, is the, 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 con the containment that you, you achieve with the split drive, is it solely due to the, the temporal containment that is you're, you're waiting for the titration of, of the cast? at which point drive stops, um, or is there a spatial uh, element there? So, I mean, it's not just the titration element because yeah, even if the, even if the Cas9, um, even if Cas9 stays at, the at a neutral point in the population, it's about the dispersal away from that point. So let's imagine you have both of those components uh, migrating out of the area that you are trying to target. They won't be uh, migrating at the same, um, they won't be migrating to a new area at the same frequency that you release them to in the area that they were in, right? Um, especially uh, the Cas9, uh, because it can't, it can't increase. So it's more about, um, it's more about how uh, the, the, the interaction, the frequency with which those two components are co-inherited. And because those two components cannot be linked, at least we hope they can't be linked, then those systems are inherently confinable. They are inherently designed to fall apart over time. Yeah. yeah. Good. I uh, just want to shout out to Charles and Caleb who had their hand up earlier in the talk and I just wanted to say I recognized that earlier and I'm just reminding you if you want to raise your hand again I'll, I'll recognize you to ask the question but in the meantime I'm going to go to the next chatted question which was from Gregory uh, Sabadogo um, and this question was uh, concerning population replacement uh, how many years the question is how many years will it take to replace 100% of a wild type population it it depends on the generation time of what you're trying to replace because these work at the generation. So to replace an elephant population would take a lot longer than to replace a Drosophila population of equal size. Um, I think in general, I, I, we're looking at for, I, I can't remember the exact details, but I believe for things like uh, Anopheles populations, the very kind of uh, small, um, isolated Anopheles populations without significant migration, immigration. We're talking um, in a perfect system, something like above 10 generations, but more, more realistically, something like 20 generations to, to, to reach that, uh, to get the gene drive up to um, an, an appreciable frequency in the, in the population. Remember that when you're Talking about these population modification systems, this the the gene drive doesn't re need to reach fixation in order to stop that disease spreading, because you're hoping that your cargo gene has a, a dominant effect. Uh, so it's actually, of course, it's obvious that your uh, all the individuals in that population will become transgenic before um, the wild type allele disappears. So. Uh, yeah, I think it's 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 a good point you make that, and depending on the system, then um, getting a population test population down to zero isn't necessarily um, needed necessarily, depending upon what 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 particular uh, threshold it would be for uh, for it to be effective economic threshold or public health threshold. Yeah. So okay, good. Yeah, it'd be tough to do gene drive on an elephant. It's taking a long time. Okay. Uh, so Emily Wamba has, has another. Uh, question about natural gene drives. And so are gene drives naturally occurring frequency? Are they higher in or lower in plants compared to animals? And would artificial ones be easier in plants or, or art? Um, 
I used to know a little bit about gene drives in plants, but I, <laughs> I'm struggling to remember it now. Yeah. Um, I believe that there are quite a few different ways in which you can have gene drive systems in plants compared to in um, animals. Um, and it, a lot of it comes because there's cytoplasmic incompatibility and um, all those kinds of things. Uh, so I believe that there would be a number of different ways that you could you could occur that could occur um, besides the the ways which we try and build them in, or they occur in um, in animals. But to be honest with you, I'm not sure I know enough about plant uh, natural selfish genetic elements to be able to answer that. Yeah, good. I'll just chime in for one, one aspect of that is that the, many of the mating systems and reproductive systems in plants to make it very difficult for gene drive systems uh, to, to implement a gene drive system, um, uh, an, art, an engineered gene drive system for sure. Uh, yeah, you know, if, if they things, self. You know, yeah. things, things that self and things like that yeah. or would make, because uh, you, know, you need outcrossing in order to uh, really facilitate. So, so in plants, there's a lot of selfing systems and those would be quite difficult to um, yeah, so that's that's one aspect. So let's go to another one. Um, uh, Emily, I see you have another. One. I'm going to move down though because I want to get somebody else. Did, uh, so Moez Khan uh, has a question. Did you look at how you could utilize the split drive in a suppression strategy? Any genes responsible for fertility and lethality that you thought about targeting with your guide RNA? And what yeah. was your experience? Okay, and also, what was your experience of scoring mosaicism in full body instead of eyes? Um, okay, so he has a couple other questions there. Go ahead and go with that. Um, so the first question was about. First question was, uh, do you, do oh, you look at how, how you yeah. can utilize yeah. a split drive in a suppression yeah. strategy? Yeah, that was that was our plan, um, and certainly that was Shui, part of Shweja's plan for while she was here. We of course never got to that stage. Um, we've done quite a lot of work in uh, as, a, as a side project um, on the sex determination system in Diamondback Moth. Um, so we have not worked that out completely, but we've got a pretty good scaffold now of what we believe is happening. Um, and that involved targeting a number of different um, um, uh, genes in that pathway. Uh, that have previously been used in a, by other people to build these kind of set, uh, sex specific gene drive um, systems. So for example, double sex um, is one which a lot of people have used previously. Um, double sex knockout lines have been made um, in um, uh, not homozygous lines, obviously, but uh, in, in Diamondback Moth before. There's a number of different other genes relating to egg production um, we didn't get to the point where we tested those in a gene drive context because, um, yeah, we just ran out of time basically. Uh, scoring the mosaics was relatively easy. The pupae are quite big um, and uh, it was actually easier to screen them under when they were fluorescent under the fluorescence microscope because you're, you're looking for the, the fluorescence is shining through the areas, the patches that are that have become uh, where the, the alleles are broken, but it wasn't that it wasn't very difficult. No. Now we're running out of time here, and I, I put up a slide that uh, I'm going to ask one more. I'm going to make one more comment and one more question. But before everybody goes, I just wanted to remind everybody that we'll continue this series, this webinar series. The next uh, webinar in this series will be next week, and it will be by Richard Flowell who will talk about controlling schistosomiasis with uh, gene drive snail immunity. So very interesting talk where he has thought about this and under what conditions something like this might be possible. So um, hopefully you know, everybody will come back and, and, and catch that webinar uh, as well. Uh, before we wrap it up, uh, Tim, I wanted to ask whether or not um, <coughs> Do you have any information based on you know anything really uh, concerning the potential uptake of this technology in the grower community, um, in the various communities that are that are actually um, you know dealing with diamondback moths and 
and whether or not, say, any genetic mod any genetic control programs, have they ever been implemented like SIT for diamond type mark? So I'm just interested in if you have any any you know any prior knowledge about the, re the potential receptivity of uh, these communities to uh, to this this technology. Yeah, I'm I'm. I don't know if a lot of conversations have occurred between the grower community um, or kind of agro agro um, agro tech uh, companies regarding and scientists regarding gene drives, but a lot has been. There's a long uh, history um, in the GM field in general, and especially with regards to Riddle uh, or. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, FS Riddle, um, which were you know first um, developed in Lepidopterans in uh, pink ballworm and in in uh, dimeback moth. That was part of my PhD, um, and I know that although that that um, uh, th those projects didn't necessarily end up being commercially um, put forward or go went forward with them. That it was, it sparked a lot of interest, especially in the the large scale uh, biotechs or agri agritechs uh, um, for the the side benefits of that kind of technology. So, for example, the the um, resistance uh, allele, the BT resistance allele dilution effect, which you get by releasing these FS riddle moths, was of extreme interest to um, um, the companies that create a lot of BT corn. For example, like that, and actually that ended up in uh, a project um, at Oxitech where I did my PhD, where they now actually, in conjunction with some of those companies, have built um, fall armyworm uh, FS riddle because fall armyworm is a huge pest of uh, of corn. So I think looking at it uh, that way, if those companies are, are are willing to take that bet, those huge uh, agri tech companies are willing to take that bet. I think that there is the appetite, especially in, in the, the large scale um, uh, uh, grower communities to, to, to employ those, those new tools. Um, I think it's always a lot more difficult when you're talking about providing a technology like this, an area-wide technology to small growers. Um, because it really needs to be done um, at the government level uh, or by an NGO or something like that. It's very difficult to imagine that you would be going around and selling your gene drive diamondback moth 100 pupae to uh, a farmer in Malaysia that has you know, a 10 square um, meter plot. Like that's just not the way these systems work. Um, so I think it, we need more engagement um, at, at that kind of level with these for these types of technologies. But I certainly know um, that for the riddle that the self-limiting systems, um, you know, for growers that were producing, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres of corn, they were they were very much on board with it uh, and and you know willing to put it forward as part of their suite of um, control tools for the, the seeds they were selling, et cetera.